One billion years in the future, Earth still exists, though maybe not as we imagine it. Eras upon bygone eras worth of technology have been left behind by eight previous and fallen civilizations. It is now up to the denizens of the Ninth World to piece together what was left behind. Perhaps they're looking to carve out their place in the world, or simply to survive a land riddled with weird and unearthly dangers. Or perhaps still, they just wish to learn and uncover the secrets of the Numenera. Whatever it is this new era of adventurers and heroes is looking to discover, they'll have to dig through the imprinted echoes of the past to find it. Hello, and welcome to Imprinted Echoes, a family-friendly Numenera actual play podcast. I'm Zan, and I'm your GM. Thank you for listening today. As always, we hope you're all staying safe and healthy. In this episode, there are many decisions to make. Our friends take some time to seriously consider their next steps along with the leaders of Legam. News of Below is passed along, plans are made, and orbs are poked. Join us as Nehemiah, Smallrin, and Jory determine their next steps as they listen to these persisting imprinted echoes. I will grab some dishes and swirl around to the sink. <laughs> Good. You guys clean up after breakfast. Do other people come in? Yeah, eventually a handful of other people kind of wander in and for food and, and such. And it's kind of just... It's very communal that if Fahura isn't there, help yourself to whatever she has prepared, but clean up after yourself. There's a big stack of pancakes uh, sitting next to kind of a wood stove. What do you want to do? Hmm. After I see that things are kind of moving themselves along, Nehemiah would go and do his morning patrol around the city, kind of get a more cognizant lay of the land of how everything has changed. Sure. Things are obviously a little bit different, a little less easily secured now, but honestly a little easier to follow the path of everything. It's a little more laid out in terms of where everything is. As you're doing your perimeter walk, you run into Brex, who kind of stops a couple feet out from you and just stares. Their visor purple. Hey, big guy. How are you doing today? Odds. Yeah, about the same. I'm going to take a walk around the outside of town just kind of do my normal patrol you want to come with they kind of just like turn and like saddle up, saddle up next to you and mm-hmm. start walking with you hmm. can you understand what that sound is saying do you know what that language is their visor turns red pink almost I'm gonna take that as a kinda <laughs> Huh. Interesting. I feel like I feel like there's something obvious. Like I know what it says, not because I know what it says, but because I've been told what it says and I feel like we're missing something. Like there's some some clue, some hint, something we're not getting. Something obvious. The visor kind of shifts back to violet. Mm. And and as you guys are, are kind of walking around your perimeter, Brex kind of starts to take the lead. Sure. And you eventually end up near the orb, hmm. kind of underneath it. Mm-hmm. And they're tall enough, they, they can actually like reach up and touch it. Sure. And they do so, and it's the same kind of like squishy mm-hmm. texture that it changed to. It's still that pale orange color. But it, they reach up and touch it, and then kind of just take their hand down and like put it to their ear and then kind of like shake their head and put it down. I'll do the same. I'll use my uh, my sword spear to kind of give myself a boosty up and mm-hmm. press my hand in and hand my ear. Yeah. It's, it's weird. It's kind of like seashell ocean kind of thing. Like you can still hear it, but it's like almost far away. Like 
Not quite coming from your hand, but like maybe similar to that. Like the song? Yeah. Weird. How'd you know about that? Shrug. Huh. And it fades after a minute. Like, yeah. Like, kind of like about the same amount of time, like if you put hand sanitizer on, the amount of time it would take to dry, that's about the same amount of time it would take to, f- like, the sound coming from your hand would fade. That's something else. And they kind of look up again at it and, like, take their, s- their hammer. Mm hmm. And, like, look up at it, like, touch the blunt end, set it back down. And look at your sword spear and kind of make a reach for it. I'll pass it off. And kind of look at you, like, asking for permission, almost. Edos isn't around, are they? No, they shake. Go for it. And they kind of, like stab up into it and it does pierce it. Huh. And out of it, kind of like around the tip of the sword spear drips the same goo that you found below. And they pull the sword spear back down and you see the slice that was made kind of like heal over. But you have this goo like the goo that we found in the jars, like the the non-Newtonian stuff. Yep. What? Hey, Brex, I think we should go and get we should get Rufus. I will scoop scoop some of this up into like my hand, and we will huff it to Rufus. Cool. <laughs> we'll get back to that in a moment. Then. Yeah. Other people, where are you going? What are you doing after breakfast? Smallrin Smallrin doesn't want to be involved in Farhura telling Edos about this, but she wants to wants to know what's going know on. About it. Yeah. <laughs> she wants she okay. wants to get close without actually being part of the conversation. Sure. Roll me stealth. Cool. Espionage? I mean, yeah, that's how it's considered. <laughs> what kind of difficulty do you want? Four. To be able to hear and not be seen. Cool. Success with a 17. Wonderful. Yeah, you kind of, you're able to kind of like position yourself just outside a window enough to be able to hear, but also get away quickly if they like come out the door. And the conversation you hear is for her very calmly explaining what's going on. And at first, Edos is insisting that they go back down there right now. That everyone just get your things, we're going down there, we we have to figure this out. After a, a couple moments, for her is able to calm them down, have them sit down for a moment, and kind of give the full breadth of the situation. Edos is still, has a lot of concern in their voice, and still seems very worked up about the situation, but is listening to reason and is ready to make this decision as a group rather than rushing off to do anything else. And is also also understands that this is, while it is something that is important to them, it is also important to other people and that, and, and for her it kind of points out, like, you know, Nick was important to everybody who was here originally and other people are willing to help us with this, but we have to do this together. You know, this can't be a decision that just you make. And they seem amenable to that. Right. Is there any other information you were looking for specifically? I don't think so. Smaller and basically, she's, you know, sitting sitting de- below the window by the wall, like, just kind of tending to, like, her forearm blade, so it looks like she has a reason for being there. She was kind of planning contingencies in her head for like, you know, if Edos was about to just rush out the door and run off she was gonna throw something in front of him and doesn't look like that'll be necessary, so that's really all she wanted to know is planning if they were going to you know, rush off, she was Mm -hmm. going to throw something in front of them, but it doesn't look like that will be necessary, so that's what she really wanted to know from them. Okay. I'm going to take my staff out for a few swings. So I'll go out into an open space and just start kind of practicing, trying to clear my head. 
you're out there kind of just swinging around, getting some good practice in. The the staff is a little heavier than before. It's clear that Rufus had to make some some additions to it, so it's balanced a little bit different. Still balanced, but just not the way you were used mm-hmm. to. But after a couple of minutes of like really figuring out, you think you're gonna be able to use this no problem. Uh, you even try doing it like you know going out of phase and bringing it with you, and it's weird at first. You've never been able to take along like a physical object before, and it stays with you, and it's really cool. Oh, this is very very neat. Whew. I'm basically trying to work off some nervous energy because I don't know what we're going to be doing next and how dangerous it could be and I feel a bit frazzled <laughs> and scared. Okay, alright. Uh, as you're practicing, Iona finds you. The de facto leader of the people that you originally helped when you came here. Practicing, I see. Oh, yes. Bit of a modification on this, so I want to make sure I know what I'm doing when I'm throwing it about. Always good to know what you're doing. I would say so. How are things going with you? We're trying to salvage what we can of the agricultural fields. We did lose a couple with the shifting. Ah, yes. Um, I'm very sorry to hear. No, it's okay. We'll make do with what we can. It's not the end of the world. It's just a little more work. I see. Well, by all means, if there's anything I can do to help, uh, and I'm not off somewhere doing something unusual, I'd be more than willing to help. Thank you for the offer, though I have a feeling if the scuttlebutt around the settlement is to be believed that you'll have your hands full very soon. Oh dear, what's the scuttlebutt say? Hopefully something glamorous. Glamorous is a strange word for it, but between all of the shifting that happened and the new song that's continually playing, what I'm hearing is that you guys were going to be going back down there at some point to try and figure out the rest of this. I suppose you could call that glamorous. Perhaps somebody will write an opera about this. (laughs) I'm not a musician. That's all right. Uh, We could always try. I'd like to hear your attempt anyway. You overestimate my abilities. And you overestimate my sense of comedy. I, I, uh... (laughs) You don't have to be funny. You can just be you. Yes, I... I'm sorry. (laughs) I'm just nervous, you know. Diving back down. Understandable. I do want to thank you, though. You and and your friends, though obviously they're not here right now. Oh? Well, just in general, the... Things have been getting significantly weirder around here, don't get me wrong, but... Quality of life has improved. Well, that's good. With all of the stuff that you're bringing back up from down below or finding out abroad... Rufus has been able to help us create things to grow food faster, catch animals more efficiently, keep our houses warm or cool. Well, as long as things have been improving. That's good. As long as there's, um, you know, it's a two step forward, one step back sort of thing. I I think, um, I think we're getting somewhere and and I, I hope it continues along that line and doesn't, you know, swap. (laughs) <laughs> that would be bad. Anything you can do to continue to improve the way of life here, all the better. Always. Well, I'll pass along that you said such nice things, shall I? Thank you. I have some projects to oversee. Have a good one. Uh, you as well. Whew. Okay, all right, back at it. Swing, 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 spin, jump, twirl. Somersault. <laughs> Backflip. I can keep going. <laughs> so I know where Nehemiah is going, Smallrin and Jory. Where do you guys end up going? Do you guys end up seeing Rufus as well, or are you going somewhere else? I will probably head to First Tree, I think, okay. just to grab a drink after my, my workout. Yeah, you get some water for her's back, cleaning things up. 
We can get that no problem. Nehemiah, you end up at Rufus, who is, their living quarters is like pretty close by and they are kind of going through a morning routine of like checking all of their equipment and gathering things up to start work for the day. Mm-hmm. And kind of humming a little tune and Bot Bot is like trundling along. Rufus? Yes? I have, we have made a discovery and I find it a little troubling. I feel like you find all discoveries um, troubling. Yes. What have you found? So, for reasons that are going to remain uh, unknown, we stabbed the orb. You did what? Okay, okay. Um, What did um, you find? And, and this came out, and I just passed them t- two handfuls of non-Newtonian fluid. <laughs> um... And then it healed itself. Oh. Rufus kind of like stretches it like silly putty kind of for yeah. a little bit. Just like, uh, kind of goops everywhere. And they smell it and it's like, mm, no, it doesn't seem to smell like anything. Taste it. Braver, braver person than I am. D- doesn't, doesn't taste good necessarily, but doesn't seem to do anything. Hmm. They listen to it they go and find like a canister like a little mm-hmm. tube and kind of put it in and then set it into a little like a centrifuge essentially sure and they turn it on it starts spinning and a little readout on a kind of like a looped piece of a synth starts coming out and they're reading it reading it reading it going well, this can... Hmm. This is... This is what we need. <laughs> it doesn't... Create power. It transfers it. Okay. So I... This... The, the fact that all of the sounds... Are in those banks down below and somehow serving as batteries. This is what turns it into that. This is what... The, the orb is recording things. And turning it into power. Huh. So that's that's whatever. So like, we could shout at it and it would turn it into power. Yes, down in the banks where the lightning friends, void friends, is that what we call void, void friends. friends? Where the void friends don't want us to touch it, so we'd have to find a way to reroute it. Sure. But that's what this does. Okay. Okay. Maybe we can work with that. I think we can work with that. All right. I think we have a lot of options that we need to consider. Would you... Would you mind gathering everybody up? Yeah. Uh, Fahura and Adriel uh, and Edos and your friends. Yep. Everybody with that's been involved in the downstairs stuff. Yeah, I'll get them. Yeah, we need to... We need to talk, I think. I think you're right. <sighs> and I will... Is Brex still with me? Yes. Uh, I'll ask Brex to get Adriel, Fahura, and... Yeah, that that crew, and I'll I'll grab the other two. Brex stomps off. Mm-hmm. You find Jory at the first tree. Where does Nehemiah find Smallrin? Smallrin just kind of appears at the first tree, roughly the same time he gets there. All right, we gotta head on over to Rufus's. We may have had a breakthrough. Oh, good. Long story short, the the orb is has a fluid in it that lets us turn sound into power, or at least a part of it. Oh, boy. Part of that. Yeah, a, a big part component of that is in there somehow. So we gotta... So it goes. Okay. How did you discover this? Brex and I did stab the orb. I just wanted to make him say it again. <laughs> it was their idea. Um, How far along in the process... Uh, did you get until you were s- reached the stabbing stage? Like, were there other things that came before this? We did touch it first. <laughs> okay, well, that's good, I guess. It's the natural progression of the, the scientific method. Well, I mean, we knew that hitting it wasn't going to do anything with, like, the hammer. So at that point, it was stabbing time. And stabbing it is so much different. <laughs> Well, yeah, oh, I mean... yes, Jory, it's a completely different type of damage. <laughs> well, I mean, technically, yes, but... 
No, no, the, it does make a great deal of difference, the amount of pressure applied and whether it's cutting or... Smallrin goes off on a very small but detailed rant about what sounds like some sort of lecture on how best to kill people depending on what kind of damage you're able to cause. This is your fault, Jory. I'm blaming you for this. Me? Why me? Small rin, small Good. rants. Yes. <laughs> that's very good. That's, that's going to be... Small rin, small rants is going to be the spinoff podcast. Yep. That, that's, uh, that's Patreon content right <laughs> yes. there. Yes it, yes, it is. So you guys head back over to Rufus's place, and Rufus has kind of set up a table that everyone can sit around and on it placed the canister of goo the device that they were talking about that might be able to use the translator to create some sort of electrical signal and a couple other bits and bobs out just as reference to what you guys have found and how this has been going you guys arrive first and after a bit you're joined by Fahura, Eidos um Brex and Adriel. You all take your seats around the table. And Rufus kind of takes point at first. There are a lot of discoveries that we have been making recently. And a lot of things that we have to decide. Decide how we will be using them, or how we plan to accomplish them, or if we plan to accomplish them at all. I'm very forthcoming and gregarious uh, but I'm I'm not the only decision maker here and nor should any of us be so as I see it we have a distress call from where or when we don't know we have some beings who need the energy that are stored in the power banks below the settlement we have the orb that has just recently been found contains a fluid that is able to transmute sound into energy and I believe that that is what is powering those banks we have an echo chamber that is being referenced in this distress call as a part of the solution but in that echo chamber is some sort of amalgamation of people passed in some sort of great accident that is I believe possibly referenced at least vaguely by what Jory has in the books the journal it talked about greater and greater scientific leaps being made and more and more strange things happening I will make the intellectual leap that something terrible happened here after they pushed science too far though I don't know what. And lastly, we have a possible, I don't have a good word for it, the spirit of our friend long gone, possibly some way connected to what's happening down below, though in what way I do not know. We need to decide if we are going to act on this distress call, and if so, how we're going to accomplish that. We also need to decide what form of power we want to pursue. And they sit back down. I vote yes for distress. That came out wrong, but I think you know what I mean. I also think that if there is a way that we can use these... This screaming column of light, it may kill two birds with one stone. Because while it inhabits the echo chamber, I don't see how we can fulfill the instructions of the distress call so we have to find some way of removing it and using it as a power source might be a feasible way of doing that Edos nods I would have to agree with you Smallrin I wish to act on this distress call and we we need to find some way to contain that force. I mean, either way, it's a solution we don't have. We barely know what it is, let alone how to contain it or disperse it or whatever. 
I mean, we don't, do we? Rufus kind of looks around at, like, the stuff that's on the table and and their living quarters, which is also a secondary workshop. Not immediately. It's not... It's not far off to figure out, though. All right, well... We have many more pieces than we did previously, and the knowledge that you guys have been able to bring back, it's... It wouldn't be long before I'd be able to figure something out. I just need to know what it is I'm making. Right. Well, if we could figure it out, maybe we can... I don't know. We could somehow use the sound, that psychic sound that it makes to use that gel and your little power generator. Maybe we can kind of combine all three of those things into one... A contraption or something. I don't know. I don't know. No, that's a good idea. It's one of the thoughts that I had. I think you're on the right track. For her, Aline Sworn goes, How much of these people of the past do we think... How much of them is left in this screaming pillar? Are we hurting people by doing this? Are we making their situation worse? And I know we probably don't have the answers to this, but I just think we all need to be okay with the possibility that we are. Oh, I am deeply concerned about that. Because that... I know what I heard in my head, and that those were not happy sounds. If there are folk trapped in there, they are hurting. And they've been hurting for a long time. However, more I'm sitting here, more I'm thinking about it. I I don't know this thing from anything else. And I tend to have, we're going to go ahead and say an unnuanced way of handling these types of problems. Maybe somehow containing it would. And even if we're feeding off some of that power, once we know what it is, once we know how to disperse it, Maybe there's something to that. Maybe we can do something for him then. Just as long as we don't end up, you know, plugging our lights into this thing for the rest of forever and forcing them to be tortured souls that, you know, power ovens. That yeah. seems a bit maudlin. Rufus shakes their head. No, no, we have enough power for the, the, the settlement. It's little... Solar things and and working off of you know Numenera, strange yeah, energies, but, uh, but not. No, this is a, this is for the chamber. I think. No, I I I I know Rufus, but I want to make something abundantly clear. I've seen what people will do when they find a piece of Numenera that allows them an incredible amount of power. We don't know what the output is off of this thing, but it might be big. And if the wrong person hears that there is a large source of power that somebody is not willing to be using and utilizing, they may come and try to utilize it themselves. I'm not trying to put a damper on any parades right here. I'm just saying... I'm just saying I've seen some people do some shady things for power. That is very true. I can think of a lot of situations I've been in that uh, the people around them would kill for something powerful, so. So, let's... If we can move forward with this, I don't like it, but I think it's the best way forward, but we gotta remember, whatever we do has gotta stay between us. Edos nods. Your moral compass is true, Nehemiah. And... I feel that I need to apologize to everyone here. I I have lived with a lot of guilt over what happened here, and I have let I have let that blind me, the chance to right what I thought was a wrong, to lift some of that shame off myself, and to get my friend back, of course, but thank you for putting me back on. Adriel's been silent up until this point. She's just leaning back in her seat. He goes, 
I sincerely do not understand why it matters if they're already dead. Because they might not be. If they're here, they ain't dead. It's a very black and white way of looking at things. I actually think it's a pretty gray way of looking at things. Like, because, you know, they don't got a body. Because even if, you know, what you saw of Nick down there, I don't think that's dead. If there's part of them, maybe there's all of them. Just, you know, I wouldn't want to plug Nick into a battery either. But Nick also isn't screaming into my brain every time I go down there, so I'm a little more sympathetic. My vote is to turn the thing on. By whatever method you guys deem ethical, that's up to you. And she kind of disengages at that point, just kind of leans back and is here and listening, but not active in the conversation. What is it? We've all decided that this is a distress call worth answering. Yes, I believe so. I'd like to put it to a vote as to whether or not we try to power this with shades of beings already in the echo chamber or if we try to find another method. I will put my vote forward that we utilize what we currently have. I understand that this might end up putting us in a quandary later on down the road, but that is a bridge I am willing to cross when we get there. And they kind of gesture to everyone else at the table. I'd rather not use the screaming pillar full of tortured folk, but... But I honestly don't got any better ideas, unless unless y'all want to sponsor a, a lovely a, a adventure for some of us to go to a nearby town and see if we can find a big old power source to haul back. But that may be time and energy that could be better spent elsewhere. I did want to throw that option out there, though. We are probably not the only folks who's had to deal with something like this before. Maybe if we go out into the world, we could find something else. And they're not bothering anybody down there as they are. Not for nothing. That is an option we haven't spoken of. We have been trying to find a solution here, but it is possible that we could go elsewhere, find a generator, find batteries, find something to power the orb without disrupting the power banks below. I like that idea. I know whenever there's trouble, there's a tendency to sort of pseudo-panic and want to address it as quickly as possible. But I think keeping cool in a situation like this and perhaps exploring the other options, there's always a way, I've found. Always an answer you didn't think of before. So maybe this is it. And that's not to say that we won't have to deal with that column sooner or later, because we do need the echo chamber. But this might be a way to deal with it more gently. Adriel kind of shakes her head. Not that I disagree with you. Do you have any idea how much a power supply that powerful would cost? Uh, no. Not a clue. More than any of us have combined. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't ways to get a hold of that money. Because there are. A delightfully criminal. Now, that once again puts us into the space of what you're willing to do. I know of places that would have such things, but the cost is not small. The people who have these... things... Not all of them only take shins, but I have a feeling that there isn't much else you'd be willing to part with. So yes, this is an option, and I'm not saying it's an unachievable one. 
but we'll need more resources. Resources that we don't have direct access to. Something to consider. I will also point out this is not me as a GM telling you that's a bad idea. That's me right. telling you it's going to have a cost. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. This is absolutely an avenue you can pursue if you want. Rufus, why don't you take a crack at it first? See what you can figure out. See what it would take to actually do what we're talking about here. And if we can... If we can do what we're talking about without hurting the folk in the basement... The the Void Friends? The Void Friends. Okay. Yeah. If we could do that, then... I don't know. I, I, I think I could I could manage with that. If you can't, if if it's too tall a task, if you're missing something, then we'll start plotting a course outwards. So don't and I'm fine with that. I, I, I can I can sleep with that at night, I think. We had also it had been mentioned that we might be able to basically reroute like, use a different power source for the orb, but I don't know that we have the resources for that yet. We may need to go back down there and poke around a little more, see how the power has gotten from the recording room up to the orb itself. We need to figure out where you would... I, I would assume wires... But we need to figure out where you would be able to connect. Oh, right, right. I think I can do this. I can see what I can do to try and find a way to utilize what we have here. Can we agree on two weeks? Yeah. Two weeks' time? I, I'm i sure it will be a little boring in the meantime, but actually... Rufus, after the past couple of days, two weeks of boring sounds so good. <laughs> that is fair. Accurate. If you don't mind going back down to the less dangerous parts to maybe help me map out some things, that yeah, that would be great. Absolutely. I think that it's the least we can do. For her uh, nods, I can agree to this. And Eidos says, I agree. I think that this is going to be... Longer than I personally wish to wait, but I understand how necessary it is to understand what we're getting into. I'll help you in whatever way I can. Uh, researching, etc. I'll put my mind with Rufus's and go from there. As will I. Is there anything else that we need to address? No, I think, I think regardless, you know... I mean, we got to look into Nick at some point, but I don't think we can really do that until the echo chamber is cleared. So, so I think two weeks, we'll figure it out from there. Edos stands and kind of unofficially adjourns the meeting and leaves. Adriel follows quickly, but goes like the opposite direction, doesn't necessarily follow Edos. Rufus stays, because this is their house. And for her, it kind of slowly rises and nods to all of you. You know, thank you for being here and for looking into these things. And it's not, it's not every day that settlements are lucky enough to have people with skills like yours. We have our own skills here, but... Edos is not an explorer. They're a they're a researcher. And Rufus isn't really a fighter. They're a builder. Adriel is something else. And I'm a talker. But you guys you're doers. And that's needed here. Thank you. Happy to be here. Of course. I don't think I've ever been called that before, but I like it. Yeah. Doer. I'll have to call you that more often. I, I don't know if I'd go that far, but I understand <laughs> what you're saying and I like it. No, no. I think at this point, Jory, you deserve a plaque. Jory. 
doer. You know what? That doesn't sound very great out of context. (laughs) (laughs) But okay. Don't know what you're talking about. It sounds marvelous. Sure, small room. Sure. You want to grab a drink? Who are you talking to? Me? Y'all? Everybody here? (laughs) The collective you. (laughs) Yeah. I think a drink sounds good after a heavy conversation. Yep. Mm -hmm. I could go for a blue something myself. You guys head back to the first tree with Fahura, who gets you all drinks and begins at this point making lunch. Thank you so much for listening to episode 26 of Imprinted Echoes. If you'd like to follow our podcast on social media, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook at Imprinted Echoes or our website at imprintedechoes.com. On that website, you'll find links to our Ghostlight Media merch store, as well as our Patreon if you're able to help us out in that way. And I would like to thank Ice Deer Brewing, Christina, and Tyler for their continued support as our patrons. If you'd like to help support us in other ways, please tell a friend about our podcast or leave us a good rating and review on any podcatcher that will let you. As always, you can find our hosts on Twitter, myself at Covered and Sawdust, Chase at TQ Loudly, Rin at Rin underscore Moran, and Bridget at Really Bridget. And also be sure to follow our network, Ghostlight Media, at GLM Pods. Thanks once again for listening, and I hope you'll come back in two weeks to hear another episode of Imprinted Echoes. And until then, may your ciphers never malfunction. Imprinted Echoes is produced by Zan Campbell-Johannes and Chase Greenling and is edited by Pat Mahood. Original show theme music is by Justin Longacre. This is a Ghost Like Media production.